I mentioned early on that we would be covering considerable sections of Isaiah, not just uh, a few verses at a time. And it is my hope this evening that we may try to gather together the message of chapters 2, 3, and 4 of Isaiah, although we will obviously um, not be examining the chapters in much detail. Let's read from the beginning of chapter 2, verse (coughs) 1. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes For many peoples, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp hands with pagans. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So man will be brought low, and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Then in chapter 4, at verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. Now, two weeks ago, we began our study of Isaiah by filling in some of the background, which I don't intend to do again. Isaiah prophesies in the 8th century B.C. and addresses himself particularly to the southern nation of Judah. And at a time when Judah is moving more and more towards the fate that the prophets prophesied concerning her as a land, and that is that God would bring judgment upon Judah, but that his purpose was ultimately a purpose of grace and salvation. Now, last time, we looked together at the way God introduces his controversy with the nation of Judah. He highlights the iniquity that there was in the land, the insincerity that there was in the temple where they sought to 
worship God with their lips, but their heart was far from him. And the injustice that there was in the city, because injustice and unrighteousness in personal and commercial dealing offends and grieves God and brings his judgment upon a people. Now in chapter 2 to 4, we come to uh, an, another section which holds together, as I hope you'll see in a moment. One of the difficulties in studying the prophets, as you may have realized, is that you really need to be able to tell when the prophet is looking through the telescope to see the distant future and what God is going to do ultimately when his whole purpose for his people is fulfilled. And when, by contrast, the prophet is looking through the microscope at the present situation, analyzing it, disentangling it, commenting upon it, speaking to the people concerning it. Now here, for example, in this passage we read this evening, you get both of these ways of prophesying. In the first section that we read together, Isaiah is looking through the telescope. Notice how it begins in verse 2, in the last days, and he begins to describe something that belongs certainly to another age than the present. Then from chapter 2, verse 6, he turns the microscope upon Judah and upon the contemporary situation and begins to analyze and prophesy concerning the present life of God's people and this nation. Then when you come to chapter 4 again and at verse 2, Isaiah turns, as it were, the telescope to see the long-term future. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors or the remnant in Israel. <coughs> now, that's how I want us to see this whole section, because it really does belong uh, together. It's like a sandwich where the top and bottom parts of the sandwich are verses 2 to 5 of chapter 2 and chapter 4 verses 2 to the end and the middle of the sandwich is this whole section from verse 6 right through to the first verse of chapter 4. Now let's look then at these uh, three sections. And as I say, you will really need to be filling this in yourself as you read this more carefully uh, at home. At the very beginning of the first of these sections then, Isaiah identifies for us when this vision uh, that he is relating to us, that he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, refers to. It is in verse 2, in the last days. Now, the last days is almost a technical term in the prophets for what we might call the messianic age. It is an age of time inaugurated by the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem and consummated or brought to its climax by the return of Jesus in glory. And the last days really comprehends that whole period. Within that period there are, of course, days which may be more crucial and significant but it is an age of which the Scripture primarily speaks when it speaks to us about the last days. Now, in these last days, notice what Isaiah is prophesying. It is quite different from what we read in chapter 1, where he describes the iniquity there is in the nation, the insincerity in the temple, and the injustice in the city. Here, he says, the temple, the place where God is known to dwell, is going to be exalted above every other high and lofty place. 
in verse 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple <coughs> will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will come to it. Now you see Isaiah's picture. It is of the temple of Jerusalem, which does stand on a hill, but you will know that even physically, the mountains are round about Jerusalem. And the hill on which the temple stands is not the tallest hill in any sense. But here, God's dwelling place, the place where people come to meet with him, is, as it were, going to be exalted to such a place of lofty glory that it will tower above every other mountain. And the picture is the peoples are flocking to it. Not just the Jews, but more especially the Gentiles. They are flocking to the mountain of the Lord. It has been lifted up and the nations are gathering together. Now, why are they coming? Well, they are saying in verse 3, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. Now, that, of course, is the most amazing kind of revival that we could possibly imagine. Here are nations, all kinds of nations, saying to one another, as it were, Come, let us go up into the house of the Lord, so that we may learn his ways and understand his truth and walk in his paths. Now, that's an amazing thing for the simple reason, you see, that by nature, peoples of the nations of the earth have little or no interest in the word of the Lord, or in his counsels. They have no desire to walk in his ways. But here, Isaiah says, in the last days, when the mountain of the Lord's temple will be raised above the hills, all nations will stream to it. The law will go out from Zion, verse 3 at the end. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem... And God is going to judge between the nations and will settle disputes and so on. Now that's a very remarkable prophecy. And in a very real sense, it's final fulfillment and only complete fulfillment is to be at the return of Christ. But it is partially fulfilled, you will notice, in the course of the last days, that is the Messianic age, at Pentecost, and in the modern missionary movement, there is a partial fulfillment of this prophecy as people come to hear that the word of the Lord is to be found in a certain place. And they say to one another, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. And that will happen when the law goes out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And it is then noised abroad among the Gentiles that the word and wisdom of God is available and they will be drawn to it. Now, in a sense, uh, this is something which we have yet to see but it is something that we already see in another sense in areas of the world where people have heard that the word of the Lord is going out from Zion, that his law is made known, and they are coming because they are drawn to hear it, that they might walk in his ways. Now you will notice the other thing that is happening in verse 4. Not only are they coming to hear the word of the Lord, but they are experiencing the power of God's truth to change the warring, rebellious heart of man and to bring to God the disputes of the nations. He will judge between the nations. 
and will settle disputes for many peoples. And then this amazing and astonishing thing will happen. The instruments of war and hatred and the resources that are applied within the realm of war and hatred will be applied rather to peace and to the benefit of the nations because they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Now, when will this happen? Again, the answer is, ultimately, this is what will happen at the return of Christ, at the end of the age, when Jesus has come in his glory. It is then and only then that war shall cease and men will turn their swords into pruning hooks and their spears into plowshares and so on. But the fact is, you see, that there is another sense in which this is the ideal world that Isaiah is presenting to the people of Judah. And what he is saying is the pathway to peace amongst nations the way to prosperity amongst the peoples is not by putting their confidence in man, but by turning to the Lord. That's the basic principle that underlies this, you see, so that this is not just a message for the end of time, nor is it a promise of pie in the sky, as we cynically say, what this is, is a principle that Isaiah is laying down for the nations now, whose great problem, as we shall see in a moment, is that they have been putting all their confidence in man. Their trust has been in human resources and human leadership and so on. And Isaiah says, there never will be peace among the nations. There never will be prosperity amongst the peoples until they have discovered that it is in the rule of God that true prosperity is to be found. Calvin writes commenting on this, Oh, that we might live under Christ's perfect rule so that we may enjoy Christ's perfect peace. Now, peace movements, you see, are great things, and peace conferences are important occasions. But we need neither to be optimists nor pessimists in this world. We need to be realists and recognize that ultimately such is the heart of man that it is only in submission to the King of Kings that we are ever going to discover true peace amongst nations. So peace is something that we are to pursue, but only under the rule of Christ is it more than a dream. Now, from verse 6 of chapter 2, Isaiah turns the microscope now upon Judah in his own day. Verse 5 is a kind of transition verse. What he is saying to them in verse 5 is, if this is the destiny of our nation, that they should thus be the people to whom the nations, the Gentiles, will come, how can we live as we are doing in the present? In the light of such a destiny, how can we live in such decay? Now we caught something of the decay in which Judah lived in chapter 1. But Isaiah turns again in greater detail to examine and analyze the nation's problems from chapter 2, uh, verse 6. And we need to recognize, I think, as we read it, that this could be a description of any godless generation. 
<coughs> I was saying two weeks ago that um, it's very difficult to find a really good short commentary on Isaiah. It's not difficult to find an extremely good long commentary on Isaiah. And the best and almost the longest is written by Professor E.J. Young, whose first two initials you would not easily forget. Young is his surname. And he was a professor of Old Testament in the Westminster Seminary where Sinclair Ferguson now teaches. And uh, he has written an outstanding commentary on Isaiah, which uh, you would find of great interest if you have time to dip into it. Of this particular passage we are turning to now, he says the contrast between verse 3, many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, he will teach us his ways, and so on. The contrast between verse 3 and verse 6 is noteworthy. There is there in verse 3, the nations have come to Jerusalem to learn God's ways. Here in verse 6, Jacob is full of the Gentiles' ways. There in verse 3, God is exalted and peace holds sway. Here, in verse 6, mankind is exalted, and terror holds sway. Now, that's a penetrating comment, not only upon this passage of Isaiah, but upon the general truth to which it refers. The nations have come to Jerusalem to learn God's ways. Here, Jacob, that is God's people, are full of Gentile ways. There, God is exalted and peace holds sway. Here, mankind is exalted and terror holds sway. Let's see how Isaiah presents that to us. The great folly of the nation is that having turned their backs upon God, as we found in chapter 1 they had done, they were now trusting in all kinds of substitutes for him, basically in various forms of humanism. It's all gathered together in the appeal of verse 22. Stop trusting in man. Now, these are four words, my Christian friends, that we need to cry to God that he would carve into our hearts. Stop trusting in man. They refer to us at every stage of our life. Before we are believers, this is what God is saying to us. Stop trusting in man throughout the whole of our Christian living. This is what God is saying to us. Stop trusting in man. In our Christian service and in our attempts to do things for God's kingdom's sake, this is what God is saying to us. Stop trusting in man, because basically that is what leads us into all manner of disaster. And here is Isaiah putting under the microscope the nation of Judah as they put their confidence in man. Notice the four particular areas where they have found substitutes for God. Let me tell you what they are between verses 6 and 8. They are superstition, economic success, military power, and idol worship. There is plain as a pike stuff in the text. It's not difficult to see them. First superstition, verse 6. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. He is speaking to God. It does appear as if the people of Jacob are abandoned by God. Notice the first of these characteristics. They are full of superstitions from the east, verse 6. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp hands with pagans. Second characteristic is economic success. 
Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. That's now what they have put their confidence in. Now, you keep applying this to the modern situation, you know. A land that's full of superstition, divinations from the East. You say, ah, oh, yes, that belongs to these old, rather primitive times with these primitive people before a technological society. Isn't it a strange thing if you ever thought that we are probably the most scientifically advanced, technologically sophisticated society in the universe, this history? And yet, what's the first thing that the vast majority of people turn to in their paper in the morning? It's the horoscope. Somebody was saying, who is a major um, newspaper publisher the other day, that they dare not produce a paper that does not have something of this kind in it in Britain today. It is a key element in securing readership. And it appears in all manner of different ways. Economic success, verse 7, their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Military power, verse 7b, their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. That's the whole world of uh, defense and military resources. Verse 8, their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made, that is, when they have ceased worshipping God and serving Him, they will worship things. Now, there are two forms of idolatry, as you will notice. The more refined form is to worship things that God has made. And people sometimes do that. They worship the sun, they worship trees, they worship various things that God has made. The more debased form of idolatry is worshipping things that we have made ourselves. You know how Isaiah mocks this in another place and says, here are the things we have made with our hands, we have formed them ourselves, and we say, you be our God. Now this is the situation. Just a word about these four areas. The first is, these things are timeless and relevant in every generation. You notice, for example, how there is a combination of uh, <coughs> living by luck and living for economic success. Uh, the first two of these in verse 6 and 7. You notice that, have you? How that creates something of a stranglehold in a great area of our society. Living by luck and living for economic success is combined, for example, in the latest way that the National Health Service is going to be funded in certain areas. You know, the, the latest way that it's going to be funded by a lottery. Very interesting. You know. What are the two elements in that lottery? Economic advancement, if you win it, which everybody hopes they will, and luck as the process by which it will happen the two things that are combined together. All forms of gambling generally have the same characteristics. And uh, these are as modern as tomorrow morning's newspaper. Notice secondly that some of these things, for example economic success and military power, are neutral in themselves. The danger they present is when man reposes his confidence in them. That is, in economic prosperity and in such things as military power, the possession of horses and chariots, as uh, Isaiah puts it, there is nothing intrinsically evil. But it is when people begin to put their confidence there. That is where our confidence is. For example, at a national level, when our confidence is in nothing else than economic prosperity, when people stand up and say, the sign that our nation is prospering is that we are economically sound. That is a most appalling heresy, because what it is saying is, we put our confidence in economic prosperity. 
Or, for a nation in the modern world to be secure is a very important thing. But for us to put our confidence in military prowess is the height of folly. And this is what had happened in Judah. And it's this that uh, Isaiah is analyzing. Now God's response to this is to humble mankind by arising in judgment. And that's the story from verse 9 onwards. So, he says, man will be brought low and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Now that last phrase in verse 9 is a difficult one. It may well be that what Isaiah is recognizing is the need to avoid an easy healing of the sickness of the nation. Man will be brought low, mankind humbled. And you will notice how that picture that we have uh, from verse 9 right through to verse 21 is one of a nation that is going to be humbled and brought down. Now, how is that going to happen? Well, three times over in that passage, Isaiah repeats a phrase. Verse 10, Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. Verse 19, men will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. Verse 21, they will flee to caverns in the rocks and to the overhanging crags from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth. What then is the answer to all the folly and stupidity of human pride, of man trusting in his own inventions and his own ability and wisdom in things that he has made and thought. What is the answer to it? It is a revelation of the splendor of God's majesty. Now that will be what happens on the day of judgment when God comes in glory. There will be a fleeing. Now you'll notice what the pattern is in Judea, as in every place where there is limestone in abundance in the rocks, there are many caves. In Cheddar Gorge, for example, the reason there are so many cavernous holes in the rock is that it's made of limestone and the water wears it away and there are great places where people can hide. Now this is the picture in Judea. People are going to flee. They're going to find themselves running as fast as they can. What are they running from? An enemy? Oh no, they are running from the presence of the Lord and from the terror of his majesty. And man in his exalted pride as he has inflated himself, what he discovers is that when he has had a revelation of the majesty and glory of God, that makes him see that he cannot even stay where God is. He has to flee into the rocks and cry to the rocks, hide us. Jesus prophesied about this regarding the day of his coming. So that will be a day of revelation. This day when God is going to bring judgment upon the people. But it's a very important thing to see the general principle. And here is E.J. Young again commenting on this he says when we exalt God now this really helped me today in my own soul and I want to ask you to listen to it carefully because I think it's one of the most important things that you could ever hear when we exalt God we too are lifted up when we exalt ourselves, 
we inevitably humiliate ourselves, leaving God alone exalted. You see the principle? When we exalt God, we too are lifted up. When we exalt ourselves, we inevitably humiliate ourselves, leaving God alone exalted. So, says the psalmist in verse 22, stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils, because one day, and this is the really vital thing, one day God is going to take every proud thing that exalts itself against him and bring it low. If you read through from verse 11 to verse 21 of chapter 2, you will see how Isaiah pictures great trees crashing down, great towers being brought to the ground, because the arrogance, verse 17, the arrogance of man will be brought low, and the pride of men humbled, the Lord alone, will be exalted in that day. Now, that's the central diagnosis of Judah's problem. The arrogance of man exalting himself and trusting in himself. And one day, God will bring his arrogance to the ground. That sometimes happens in time and in our own personal history. It will definitely happen at the end of time, when the Lord Jesus returns in glory. Now, chapter 3 leads us into the nature of this judgment of God upon a nation that relied on human leadership. Now, one of the really interesting things about this whole passage in Isaiah, and I hope you will read it more carefully, is that, in fact, the ultimate fruit of a godless society that relies upon human wisdom and leadership is that God removes from them the very things in which they had trusted. Now, historically, that was true in Judah. Uh, one of the things that happened when the kings came uh, from Babylon and Syria to invade Judah was that they took away the cream of the nation. They captured the leaders. Notice how God describes it in verse three, 1 of chapter 3. See now the Lord, the Lord Almighty is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the things they had taken for granted. And then... The hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the soothsayer and the elder, the captain of fifty and man of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman and clever enchanter. And what's going to happen, you see, is that God is going to teach this nation a lesson by leaving them bereft of men of quality. That's a very significant thing. And the result is in verse 4, I will make boys their officials. Mere children will govern them. Now, I'm not sure, to be honest, whether that means that there are going to be boys or whether it's a reference to a certain very young king who arose at this time. What I do think it means is that they are going to be absolutely bankrupt of leadership. Now, you can see signs of that in history in various places. The quality people were taken away. Mere children will govern them. Now, notice the results of this. I've just time to call your attention to them in verses 5 to 9. Anarchy and violence in verse 5. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise against the old, the base against the honorable. Anarchy and violence. An amazing thing, you know, how uh, we have become such a violent nation. 
I suppose many of us don't really realize just how violent it is in, in so many ways. You know, I think uh, those of us who are friends in the casualty units of hospitals begin to discover just a little about this kind of thing, you know. I was hearing about a, a fellow who came in to one of these hospitals the other day. Huge stab wound on his side. And they put a, an x-ray picture up on the wall above and uh, the doctor said to the man, did you know that you got a bullet in your stomach as well as the stab wound? Oh, I forgot to tell you, doc. He said, they shot me too. That's the Royal Infirmary here in Glasgow. Not a year ago. The violence, the sense of cruelty. You know these marvelous things that they produce in, in Glasgow, uh, in various places around the country, flumes in, in swimming pools, you know, marvelous for children. Somebody was about to take some of their children there the other day. What did they discover? You know, you come hurtling down this flume at a fantastic speed. The tube goes out into the outside and then comes back in and hurtles you into the swimming pool. The sort of thing I'd just love to do if I had the effrontery. <laughs> why could they not use it? I'll tell you why. Somebody had carefully inserted in the seams of the flume a whole series of razor blades. And the children were sliced and carved as they fled down it. Anarchy and violence. Notice in verses 6 to 7, desperation and folly. The kind of desperation especially for leadership. A man will seize one of his brothers at his father's home and say, you have a cloak or you have a coat or a jacket maybe. You be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day he will cry out, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. That's the day that is coming, you see, for Judah. For Judah when there are going to be people running around and saying, the thing that makes a man stand out, he's got a coat, let him be our leader. And he will say, I cannot do a thing for this heap of ruins. My dear friends, I don't think we are so far away from that in the Western world that we have time or ability to say, well, that's another ancient world. Notice in verse 8, defiant godliness, godlessness. Jerusalem staggers, Judah is falling, their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence, defiant godlessness. You don't need to look too far uh, to see that. It's coupled in verse 9 with brazenness and shamelessness. The look on their faces, verse 9, testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom, they do not hide it. And of course, you see, whenever somebody says, we need to hide that, we need at least to have some shame about that, do you know what the cry is in our modern society? Censorship. We can't have anybody telling us what we are going to read or put on our television, and so on and so on. But it's very interesting. Then there comes God's word of judgment, beginning at the end of verse 9. Woe to them, they have brought disaster upon themselves and interestingly let me just take a moment to point this out to you when God does enter into judgment you notice who he enters into judgment with in verse 14 the Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people it is you who have ruined my vineyard. Oh, what a solemn thing that is to hear however we apply it.
Now let's look at chapter 4 from verse 2 and just in a moment or two. What is the answer to all that? Well, in chapter 4, verse 2, it is in the branch of the Lord. In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the remnant in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem, the Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the blood stains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Then the Lord will put the marks of his presence over his people, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it will be a shelter. The Lord himself is the one who will provide the answer to all the ghastly analysis of human failure. And you will know, perhaps, that in the rest of the Bible, the branch may well be a figure of the Messiah and that Isaiah is already looking forward to the day when he who is the branch of the Lord will appear and through him the Lord will wash away the filth and cleanse Jerusalem. How greatly we need to learn the lessons of Isaiah's prophecy and particularly the folly of trusting in man and perhaps last of all to hear his words again. Stop trusting in man. Of what account is he?